Hello, welcome to another session of Advisory in Real Life, where we talk to people who don't just play advisors on TV, right, Tricia? <laughs> right. <laughs> We do it in real life. So I'm thrilled to have Trisha O'Connor here with me today. Trisha does it all. She's got all kinds of certifications. She's got an MBA, a Bachelor's of Science in Business Administration. She's completed the level five training that I offer. She's an elite advisor for Intuit and in the Insightful Accountant Top 100. That's a lot of words. Trisha, what is that? Insightful Accountant Top 100. The, the 100, the top pro advisor. Yeah. 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 That's, that's a cool award. That's a yeah, publication that's that awards thing. that. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And then a certified Fathom advisor. Go Fathom. We love Fathom for dashboards and Fathom. interactive stuff. So tell us about your firm. Well, here's my thing about me. I'm Jeannie Whitehouse. I'm a, a consultant to wineries in Napa Valley through an amazing firm that only works with winery clients and affiliates and related companies. Broke Markle Davis, BD Co. CPA. I have a speaking business called evenanerd.com. And my latest thing as of COVID was I acquired the rights to training that I took myself in early 2000. That's where Trisha and I connected with each other. And I teach level five, the methodology through the impactfuladvisor.com. And there, there was an online training component. And then I add stuff on top of that. So Trisha went through both the online training and some of the assisted coaching sessions that we did on top of that. But the number one most important question I have for you, Trisha, is where did you go to school? Well, Jeannie, you should know this because I am a proud Tar Heel University yes. of North Carolina. Yep. Fellow Tar Heel, I graduated in 81 and you graduated the year one before One year before me. you did. Yeah, one year before yours, you did. Was yours I think December? it's so funny. We were both getting BSBAs. That's right. We had to have been in the same classes together and we never met. I know. And yes, well, I graduated in December. Yeah. So when you went for accounting, you had to go four and a half years. So all the accounting grant people had to graduate in December because then we had enough stuff to take the CPA exam. So yeah. Did you we walk? I didn't bother to go back. I went to graduation to watch all my friends graduate in June. And then I had I moved to Atlanta. I didn't even go back to walk. To I graduate. didn't go back either. No, yeah, that's kind of a bummer. And they should let us walk in June. And well, just make sure I, I know. It was weird. It was sad. And you kind of didn't have that closure you didn't have no. that that celebration experience but I and was parents over. your parents put you through four and a half years of college yeah and then you didn't walk because you'd left and gone and you were now you know working someplace yeah, so you, i think so they were go back for it my parents were happier to see me employed they, they weren't too <laughs> sad about the missing yeah. the, the pomp and circumstance thing yeah. but yeah so it was really amazing and you grew up where trisha where are you from originally well so that's a good question um i consider Asheville, north carolina home but my parents moved a couple of times before we ended up in Asheville. So um, as of today, I've lived in uh, seven states. But before I got out of college, I had lived in 11 houses. Good grief. That's yeah. So I moved around a little bit. So we, we got to Asheville and that kind of stuck, and which is how I ended up at Carolina. Um, so I consider Asheville, North Carolina home, but I was actually born elsewhere and, and lived elsewhere. Both states are not worth mentioning. So um <laughs> I consider North Carolina home, and now I am a forever resident of Denver, Colorado. I'll, I'll well, never leave. So. Fantastic. So yeah. I grew up an hour from Asheville in Greenville, yep. South Carolina, and Asheville was always my dream location. I always wanted to end up there until I moved to Napa Valley and went, okay, I guess I could stand living out here. And I love that it. That is so funny because I, I couldn't it. wait to get out of Asheville well, as you know. a college kid. And now it's like the place. To it be is the place. Or, it's yeah, beautiful. It yeah. It's and nice. we would go up to the mountains every weekend and stuff up there. And it was beautiful. So anyway, okay. So let's talk about why we're here together, not just to catch up on all of our Southern stuff and Asheville and all the fun things that we share, but your professional journey, we have a lot of similarities there too, Trisha. So how did you start in accounting? What made you go into accounting? And then what's that journey been like for you so far? Uh, well, so that goes back. So I, I have this, this degree in accounting from Carolina. Uh, so I did the traditional thing. I went to work for what was then Ernst & Young in Atlanta. Now, I mean, Arthur Young, now they're Ernst & Young in Atlanta. And, um, and then I, I moved to another state and I went to work for uh, Pete Marwick at KPMG. But pretty much on my two year anniversary, I quit public accounting. And I needed two years for the CPA certificate. I, I quit and went to work for a, what had been a client of um, Arthur Young. So I, I worked in industry for 10 years with um, American Airlines. And I did, uh, in 10 years, I did a ton of things with them. I changed jobs about every six to 18 months. And it was everything from internal auditing, external auditing, um, 
marketing planning, business planning. I went to work for a subsidiary. We bought another subsidiary. Uh, I traveled around a ton. And so we, we bought this subsidiary that had 10 locations throughout the country. And I had been on the road buying them and bringing them on board for quite a while. Yeah. And at some point I said, please get me off the road. Uh, <laughs> at the time I was living in Birmingham, Alabama, it was supposed to be for three months. It ended up being a year. Uh, and at the nine month mark, I said, please get me off the road and out of Birmingham, Alabama, or I quit. Um, Cause I, I had a house in Texas. I had a cat. I, you know, I had stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, and so when they, when they got me off the road, they offered me the um, CFO position of the chain that I had just helped them buy and bring on board. And that was a general aviation company, a fixed space company called AMR Combs. So we handle private and corporate aircraft on the airport. You know, you don't land, you don't go to the terminal, you go to a general aviation. And so yeah. I did that as their CFO. And then after four years, we were going to sell that. They wanted to move me back to Texas. And I politely said no. And um, I started an accounting firm in 1993 when I quit that job. So wow. I did the traditional thing, sort of. I, I, I did yeah. the, what I thought was the traditional thing. Yeah. I started a firm. Organically, it grew and, and, it, and it became a practice. But it grew into a tax practice. And so I had a lot of tax work. That, that is primarily what I did, tax. And the occasional consulting with a client on, you know, maybe a business purchase or, you know, the occasional thing, but it was primarily tax. Um, at the time, soon after I started the practice, I, I adopted my daughter and I raised her on my own and the practice made money and it organically grew and everything was fine. Uh, I, you know, I suffered through tax season and so on, but my, my daughter graduated from high school and that summer she graduated from high school. I had some revelations and one of them was, I hate what I do for a living. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And so I, I suddenly that summer, I'm like, oh my God, I hate what I do for a living. And so I went to, I came out of my cave and I went to a conference and I can't remember if it was the very first conference I went to or a, a subsequent one that I heard you speak. Um, oh and it was on that cusp of when everybody started to talk about advisory. And so I went to this conference, I heard all these great people speak and they were doing all these things. And it was funny, I felt like I did felt like I was coming out of a cave. I'm like, where have I been all these years? These people are doing these great things. I've been suffering through tax deadlines and driving myself crazy and working until <laughs> 2 a.m. And here these people are, they've got all these people that want, you know, accounting they're willing to pay for and they want these advisory services. So I started hearing that. And so this is 2015. And so I heard yeah. you. And so then I I wanted to start, you know, making that turn to that. Um, so that's 2015. It's 2023. And, and Jeannie, the advisory piece of it's been working now for about two years, maybe two and a half years. It took that long to get to where I'm now at advisory. So I went from this tax centric firm, myself, maybe a couple of employees, a couple hundred tax returns a year, being miserable to <laughs> this now you know, this yeah. many years later where I have 20 clients and I make more money than I ever made and I'm not doing a whole lot of tax, but it took a long time. And, and the reason why is I went to the conference and I heard all this great information. Everybody needs to move to advisory. You need to move to advisory. Yeah. And while everybody talked about moving to advisory, nobody told me how, to how, how do we move to advisory? Please tell me how you do that. that that's the trick, right? That yeah, really I can, is I can buy into the concept, but what does it mean when I sit across I from a did. client? I bought into the concept. I'm like, I love it. I love that idea, but yeah. are people really, so there was the concept of one going to advisory and then there was the getting paid what the advisory is worth. And while you heard a lot of great people speak on do advisory and, and get paid well, nobody told me how to go about doing it. Um, mm. And so that's, I think why it took me so long. It took me a good, so we're what, eight years in, it, it took mm. me a good five years to make the transition to oh okay and now I'm I'm kind of seeing how this works so so that's that's my history sort of you know I did the traditional thing for a long time became very unenamored with it yeah. um and and then started hearing all of the people speak in my industry and decided it was time for me to to make a, a change and, and I thought I was kind of on the tail end of it um come to find <laughs> out you know now that you and I have been working together for three plus years come to find out I still realize that we're, we're still we're still on the front end of it not enough people are doing it well and at one conference or another that one of the groups that I'm involved in there was a session topic called has advisory jumped 
the shark. Yeah, you and I talked about that. Which is a, a thing from um, Happy Days. And when, when Fonzie jumped a shark or something, it was an indication that, that it was... They'd gotten a, so desperate that they That it was a tired topic that we were yeah. done talking about it. Well, it might be a tired topic, but the profession is not there. So no. we can't jump the shark until all the... We are the shark, I guess. And the profession but is still <laughs> lagging to adopt Here's this the stuff thing, and though. do it. People yeah. are tired of us talking about it. I know. I think people in our industry are tired of us talking about it because the people who are listening are struggling so much with how do I make the switch? Well, that I'm here to tell them how. All about to kill me is well. I and, think they're tired of hearing about it because they haven't been given the path to how we get there. Well, that's what I speak about. That's why we're doing advisory in real life, because what we have is the how. It's what I do when there's a client across from me. It's what I've been using. And I've been speaking about this since 2000. So, yeah, my shark is tired. You're tired of shark. hearing it. You're an tired of the topic. Shark. I'm tired of saying it. Yeah, I've got a big rant about why the profession is driving me nuts right now because they're not doing it. But the tools are there. And, and Tricia, the tools went online in 2018. So in 2015, I was sending you to Edie, Edie Osborne, who created the methodology that I got trained in back in 2000. And she only offered live training that was like a, I think a, a $25,000 investment. And I think it was three days, multiple times a year that you had to go places live. And it was a huge commitment and investment. And she was primarily working with bigger accounting firms. So it wasn't approachable or affordable by sole practitioners in most cases. And so one of the challenges was it wasn't really something that we could get out to as many people. And that's why in 2018, she decided she wanted to stop going on the road and put it online. And then I helped her put this online program together. So now we can get it in the hands of more people and make it easier for to use, but it is a hundred tools. You take them and you do stuff. You don't just sit around and think about it. And I think that's one of the things that is most exciting about you and some of the other people um, that have been through the program since I've been working with them. And, and I took the rights on during COVID when I realized that I'd been speaking about it and people would sign up for the training online only, and then they'd want support. And I wasn't authorized to really do that. So I, took on the right so I could add coaching and do other stuff on top of the online training. So when you came on board, first you did it on your own, right? You took it, did. you did the, yep. the online training and then you reached out and said, I want more. I want some more context around it. So tell, tell us more about that. Well, So a couple of things happened. So, you know, so I started going to conferences. You were speaking at every conference I went to. So we just kept running into each other. And after we found out yeah. the whole Carolina thing, you know, we started to connect. <laughs> um, and so I, going to the conferences, there were a lot of people who spoke at conferences and then gave you a way to, you know, take their Sold product. something. That sold yeah. you something, yes. Yeah. And I did, I did one or two of those. Um, yeah. You know, I got, a, I got a little out of it more about how to sell advisory than how to provide advisory. Um, yeah. There are lots so, of different people talking about different aspects. Right. And so yeah. went to a conference, you were at it, uh, you had, you brought out this product that was a do it yourself. Uh, you can have a year to go through the material. I did it. I loved it. Um, I have a QBO roundtable group of people and, you know, we all, we're all talking to each other about how to change our practices and so on. And so I went to my QBO roundtable group. I said, I really think you guys need to need to take this class. And uh, and so then I talked to Jeannie about that and she let me take it again and just be in the group with them to go through it uh, with them for another year. So so I got I got access to the material for two full years, which was was awesome, because <laughs> like so many people, I signed up for the class in January. And then, of course, tax season hits. And so then it's tough to actually do the material. So I didn't jump into the material until probably summer. And, and once I got deep enough into the material and saw its real value and and the tools and the information and the process, then it, then I kind of got I got hooked. I'm like, oh, my God, this stuff is, is great. I think the do it yourself and giving me a year to do it is better than than what Edie we all love Edie what Edie offered in the past because the it, there's a lot of content there is some yeah. there's so much great content that you can't absorb all of it in 3 days several times a year you you need yeah. to be able to use your time to take some of the tools and put them into practice and then add a tool to that one and put that yeah. into practice it's to build your kind of you know how we build our tech staffs to kind of yeah. build your tool stack 
Yeah. Uh, you can't you can't absorb it all at one time because you have to be able to put it into play. Yeah, uh, and I I took it that way, and I, I it's really hard for me to imagine that you can. I mean, I'm just thinking about it. We sat there for three days and went through a, basically the oh, entire I material. I would have been overwhelmed. Yeah. I would have been, I would have come home and would not have been able to to have and retained just like, much of it. I know, and and then the people were asking for the materials online, but it was a huge commitment to do that and to get it all in that format. So finally, um, it took her road um exhaustion for her to to make the commitment to do it and i think it, it's it's a great offering and again it makes it far easier for us to reach more people with it, it makes it more it affordable does. but you still have to it takes a lot of discipline to sit there and do it on your own well but uh, you know a year uh, Grant, i told you i didn't start it until june yeah and yeah. i still well, got through it in the six yeah. months that was left well, so it's 14 hours of video so if you just time that that doesn't sound that difficult but it's the mental absorption time that happens after that well and the tool set the tools themselves uh, the, the, the the all of the tools the, the spreadsheets the worksheets the how-tos the tools are so comprehensive that uh while you watch the video and, and Edie does a beautiful job of, of explaining the tool set but yeah. you watch the video you still need some time to take a tool set and start with it and say, okay, let me start with one client. Let me see how this scope thing works. Let me see if I can yeah. bring that thing out. Yeah. Um, and so it takes you a while to, to build through it. And so the year and being able to do it somewhat at your own pace, because even if you attend the monthly Zoom meetings, yeah. even if you're not caught up on the material, the meeting's still worthwhile, even if you're a little behind the other people. Yeah. Uh, but you can do it at your own pace, absorb it at your own pace and, and start putting pieces of it into your practice and work with them for a few months and then decide, okay, now I want to, I want to add this other thing to it. So I think the year is, is great because it gives you enough time to work around your own schedule to absorb the things. And then the, the tool time, the once a month, you know, let's take a tool and, and dig down deep, drill deep. Um, I think that's really worthwhile because the, the tools are fantastic. Um, but it, you do need you, ha, you have to work with them. And so it's great to talk to other people about what they're doing with them, how they're using them. You know, we've combined a couple of things. Um, you know, there's we have the scope thing, which is huge. We also have the critical success success factor thing. We've kind of combined those into a, a thing that we do yeah. scope around critical success factors. Um, yeah. And so you, you need some time to, to build the way you're going to approach your clients and which clients need what tools. Um, yeah. But it's the first, I, I told you this when when I when I talked to you after we did the training. It's the first thing in all these years that I was trying to figure out. I, I'd love to be an advisor. I, and I think I, I'm good at it. I have the right, you know, personality, I have the right mentality for it. But could somebody please just tell me how? How do we how do I make myself worth what I what everybody's telling me I should charge? We were yeah. hearing all of these people who wouldn't be real specific. It was always very vague, but but they would give you these stories about people who are making ten thousand dollars a month per client. I'm like, what what in the world am I going <laughs> to do for, for ten thousand yeah. dollars a month? I'm not just going to gouge people. Yeah. So it was yeah. the first time I actually started to see the process, and it starts with the questions. Really, the question piece of it, which is the first thing she goes into, is questions. Um, and that's a it, life changer. The, it is a life changer. Mm. Just starting to have your conversation with your clients differently. Um, I just found it. I mean, it was life changing. And I told you one of the other things that I tried in how to become an advisor that was really more how to sell it. Yeah. What that program was about is get everybody to their pain. <laughs> Make people and I'm suffer. Like, yeah. I'm like, Make I can't do suffer. it. I, I feel like a used car salesman. Get everybody to their pain. Well, what's going to happen if you don't do this? Well, your business is going to go under and your children are going to starve. And, yeah. you know, and so I, and I, I, I didn't like that. This yeah. was more about my approach, which is bring everybody to their joy. My Imagine is, the future. Imagine yes, a, because a you and I future. both buy into that creative visualization That's manifestation right. thing. I yeah. wanted to bring everybody back to their joy of why did we start this business to begin with? What did you want it to do? And let's go from a joy and get you going versus yeah. well if you don't do your cash flow you're you know, going to go you know, under that, and... that's like a that's like the whole compliance focus right do this or you're going to go to jail or right? everything's terrible yeah that's so... why we we fled from that kind of service delivery already we don't want to come back to advisory and do that same thing make people right. feel bad or scared or suffering as a result of what we can do with them so yeah this approach shift. is so much better because the first thing you get out of the gate is 
Well, he, the freeing part, I don't have to come in with a solution. Isn't that, a, that's like you can feel the weights with, lift off your shoulder. Yes. I don't have that to show up with my expert hat on. I am a genius. Which, right. And which then as soon, well as, for me. as soon as you realize that, you're like, well, how the heck was I supposed to come in for a solution? I barely know anything about you or your business. And exactly. I'm supposed to have a solution in an hour. Um, well, here, let me do a spreadsheet. That's what we do, right? Love, whatever. Yeah. Oh, here's a spreadsheet. They're done. Uh, so realizing one <laughs> that let's start the conversation first, your, your yeah. person, your client knows about their business. They, they know it. Let's start some conversations. Let's get them talking to us and let's not at every turn say, well, here's how I fix that. Well, here's how I'd fix that. You don't, you don't know enough to start offering up all of these fixes. So the first freeing part was learning how to have the conversation with your client that says, tell me what's going on. And what do you think the hurdle is? And how do you think that's a, is that a people problem? Is that a process problem? That's something we work on a lot from the program is, is it a people problem? Is it a process problem? Start the conversation, get the person talking about where they wanted their company to go and where they think it's gone awry. And then you can start picking out the things and say, okay, cool, let's do scope on this one. And let's yeah. see how we can drill down deeper. And it's, the process is just so much more organic to get to what do we need to be thinking about and how do we pro how do we map a process? How do we improve it? How do we standardize it so it's done the same great way every time? Yeah. And, and it just the, the, it just makes so much more sense that the getting them to talk gets you so much further down the road so that you can start using scope and critical success factors and process mapping and performance measurements and um, you know the and the end in mind. I mean, everybody talks about having the end in mind. We all buy into it because it it's true. It's real. That's right. It but we work. don't but we don't capture it, find out about it or or identify it for most of no. our clients. No. We just start with the fire that they want us to put out, whatever that flaming thing is. And usually it's I haven't filed tax returns for the last three years. And we or, jump or into that. I can't make payroll next week. Or I can't <laughs> make payroll. Yeah. But that used to be if you came to me with that when I was doing tax. So I did tax too. So Tricia, did you start in tax? In public accounting? No, I was an You're auditor. An auditor, yeah. Mm, that's even worse. I know. Yeah. I look back and think, why didn't yeah. I go into MA? I should have been in in um, oh, advisory services then. So I mean, I had took one audit class in college, and the next thing you know, I'm I'm auditing somebody's yeah. books. I'm like, why is anybody letting me do this? I don't know what I'm doing here. Well, in the big time practice in the Big Eight firm where I started in Hickory, North Carolina, with 25 people, we didn't have an MA option. We either had to go in order for me to get the job in Hickory right out of school at UNC, I had to agree to start in tax and in that small office, which was a satellite of the Charlotte, North Carolina office, because mm -hmm. my grades were under the cutoff. So um, I started in tax and that's what I did for 15 years. I started in auditing. way there. Yeah. From I, I liked auditing. I think auditing gave me a background that is worthwhile to me now. It does. Um, once I figured out what the hell I was supposed to be doing while I was auditing, <laughs> it gave me the background I needed to you know, I do know I really am, I'm really great at the accounting. Um, I didn't fall into this was not a calling for me. I should have told you that in the beginning. I got yeah. into accounting because I was failing in computer science. <laughs> um, so it wasn't like, you know, I wasn't being called to accounting, but I do have the mind for it. And so I am really good at accounting. Thank God I have staff that do it. But I think the yeah. auditing all of those years and then the obviously you know running an accounting department myself, it taught me all of the ways that you can screw up your accounting which, uh, you know, make you fall into the black hole of, of you can't reconcile anything because it's a mess. So I think yeah. it helped me. But I think if I had started off in tax to begin with, I might not have lasted the two years to get my certificate. I made it four and a half years in public. And then I went to corporate oh. tax and was in a big company in, uh, and got transferred to freezing cold but beautiful Minnesota for two and a half oh, years Lord. where I worked for a, um, a wholesale grocer. But the thing about that is when you go from public where you're exposed to different companies all the time to be in a corporate role for me where it was the same thing every year. There wasn't any you know, new thing coming in. We were acquiring companies. But once you master the job, it, it's there's nothing new to grow into. So that was part of why. So after two and a half years in the corporate, I went back. I uh, moved from the cold back to Atlanta to be back in the south. And then I started doing other stuff. But um but there are challenges, but that exposure inside a company mm. is extremely powerful to see what it feels like to be on the other side of the public accountant yes. or to get financials that you don't understand. And in my case, I mean, I understood them, but you're in a group with people 
and nobody else knows what the financials mean or what any of the terms mean, and nobody explains it to people. And so that understanding, I think, was useful. And then I went back to Atlanta, started a practice there around computer consulting, and then went to, to software company. So I made partner in tax, and that's when I realized, it took me a long time, Tricia, but about the same number of years, I think, um, to figure out that I didn't like to do tax either. And it wasn't until I made partner, I got to the end of the rainbow and went, this isn't going to get any better. I'm going to be no. doing this tax stuff for the rest of my life and never see my kids. And you know what the chair. funny, a funny side story is. So, you know, I've got this CPA certificate and I kept it all these years. So public yeah. accounting, went to work for American. When I went to work for yeah. American, I was in internal auditing and then I was in external auditing. And so they kept us up on our, you know, CPE and, yeah. And so on. Well, then when they moved me to Denver and I was going to be the CFO, when I left public accounting, I swore I'll, I'll never go back into public accounting. I didn't do anything with my CPE at all. And so then I get to the point where I'm quitting in January of 1993. And in December, I call the state of Oklahoma where I passed the exam. And I said, hey, um, my certificate's lapsed. And so, you know, what do I need to do to bring it current? And they said, well, you need 240 hours of CPE oh, and you are 30 days from being seven years past, seven years inactive, and you'll have to take the exam again. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I didn't tell you that story. Oh, yeah. No. I was 30 days and 240 oh. hours of CPE out. And I was like, I was panicking. And I said, does it help that I just completed a master's degree? They and should've. she said, you're golden, girl. And I'm like, oh, oh thank oh. God. <laughs> There's no way. I don't know what I'd be doing because I ain't taking the exam again. I'm yeah, not taking just the exam again. Trisha and I had just former CPA. Former CPA <laughs> cleaning toilets now. Um, <laughs> I think you could still do some tax work. <laughs> thank God I had finished that master's degree. That met my wow. CPE requirement. And I, I managed to reinstate before I was going to go inactive. Yeah, I've, I've kept mine active. Yeah, even though I don't do I don't do real public accounting. I am in a CPA firm and I am still a CPA, but I'm not. If you want to have those initials behind your name, you got yeah, to keep that thing. Yeah, <laughs> and the CITP thing, the Certified yeah. Information Technology Professional from the AICPA. So, yeah, but, you know, there's stuff you, you, you take your classes. But as many conferences as we're attending – it's not a problem to keep the CPE current. No, the CPEs, you can get it pre pretty much because you attend enough yeah. conferences and there are always people offering something that, you know, Gusto or Fathom or something. Well, CPA sponsors. Academy does free CPE. Oh, my God. I love all the CPA time. Academy. I speak for love them all the time. People. They're a great place to present. They do everything right. OK, so let's talk more about advisory. So you have this advisory thing. You, you heard me talk about it. in 2015. All I could do was talk about it and send you to Edie. Cause I didn't have a toolkit or anything or really the rights to it. I was just so excited about it. And I was using it at that time with my own clients and just talking about my own experiences and what it felt like to, to make the shift into the advisory realm. But so what happens when you sit across from a client with one of these tools, what is that dialogue like and how was that different from what it used to be? So now, so obviously now our website, everything that we do is geared towards letting people know we don't provide standalone services. Don't don't come to me if you want a tax return done. Don't come to me if you want us one. to. The yeah, don't come to me if you want us to clean up your QuickBooks. We don't do any standalone or any one-time projects. So everything on our website is geared towards advisory. But initially, okay. what really happened is people came to us for the tax return. Or right. the QuickBooks cleanup. Right. And for the first several years, I just had to keep explaining to people, you know, we don't work like what you're used to. We're not like the traditional accounting firm anymore. This is yeah. what we do. And we'd have the conversation that we work in this role where we come in and we try and build a better business and we try and find out what your hurdles are, why the business didn't get to where you wanted it to go to begin with. And sure enough, the person who called for a tax return or called for bookkeeping, they, that, after that conversation, they're like, well, that's what I really need. I'm like, yeah, I agree. They didn't know, they didn't know they we didn't as know a profession, they, right. well, they didn't know we could do that stuff. Right. If they didn't CPA, know that we existed. Yeah. yeah. So they were thinking, because this is what our, our industry didn't do a great job, really. We've of trained educating. them. Yeah, we didn't educate our business clients to know what we were really capable of. We didn't sell ourselves very well at all. Well, okay, and Trisha, so, but hold on. I don't know about you, but when I came out of college, I knew how to put stuff in the right column, debit or credit, and I knew how to make things balanced. But if you asked me what to do to make my books better, I couldn't have told you. No. 
I, I if you had the, said, what do I need to do to make my cash flow a little consistent, more consistent? I, I mean, I, I probably would have figured it out eventually. Well, uh, I could have said it has something to do with AR maybe. But I yeah, mean, maybe I we no. need to collect sooner. And then, oh, maybe no. we need to bill sooner. Oh, well, wait a minute. Maybe our contracts need to be stronger. I mean, you just start, you start <laughs> you, stepping back to why you, aren't I collecting? And yeah, we could have figured it out. And I was doing what one-off stuff mm -hmm. like that. But it, but it was always extremely stressful. And I had to go in there and really feel like I was falling off a cliff to start doing things that I didn't have any real methodology behind right me. right and, so, and the client was thinking you know the I, we, we try not to use the term bookkeeping anymore because it has yeah. a very low rent kind of feeling to it um because most industry, people are saying client accounting services now right, because bookkeeping to our business clients in their mind they think it's you know 25 dollar an hour stuff it's bill paying and um, right. and recording invoices. Right. That's all so, they understand. And again, they don't understand what that is either, which is, again, part of our own shame that we haven't educated right. people. Our industry did not do a good job of, right. one, realizing that all of us CPAs had, you know, I've got 40 years experience now, all of our us CPAs who had experience, we had aptitudes and skills and, and ways of working for business clients, but we never sold ourselves well we never realized we should be doing that we, we just didn't do a good job uh, of communicating did, well, with we our were businesses. too busy doing the crappy stuff that doing we didn't taxes like to do. yes but also and, trish i want to broaden that it's not just cpas they are amazing bookkeepers that are oh, equipped with advisory that firm. are seeing pain and suffering and solving yes. problems every day who don't get the recognition or credit they deserve they're taking these tools and going nuts well I, as I mentioned to you the first conference, first couple of conferences I went to, yeah. what I discovered was having CPA behind my name, actually, and you and I have discussed, sometimes it's a burden to have CPA it's, behind It is. Because our professional there are things standards, we can't do. they limit us. But I went yeah. to these conferences and found out there were there were people who had bookkeeping firms that had million-dollar practices. Kicking it. They were kicking, kicking it. it. Yeah. Kicking it. And I was working myself to the ground during tax season yeah. and nowhere near a million dollar practice. So it was actually, I think, the bookkeeping firms who had a little bit more freedom because I didn't have CPA behind their name, that they yeah. made the realization of what was possible. And the, the CPAs just scooped in and said, well, heck, we can do that. Um, <laughs> I think I think they were the first people to figure it out and we just followed suit. Well, they didn't have the same bookkeepers. And this the first time I spoke at a bookkeepers conference was at Sleater, Doug Sleater's first the first conference I was a keynote. It was the first time I'd been in front of a, of a different audience. I'd been speaking to CPA conferences and events, and people came to those to get their mandatory training credits, right? Trisha, we went to check the box. Right. When you go to a, a QuickBooks or a or a Sleater conference or a Scaling New Heights, people who are in the in the pain and suffering with their clients go to these events to try to solve client problems. Right. Exactly. They're looking at vendor solutions. They're meeting with the vendors. They're looking for stuff they can take back and do things with. It's a very different vibe. And they're jumping up and <clears throat> excited about stuff and they're asking really tough questions. And so that that shift for me was was a huge positive. And they're also they actually respond when you make a joke. Yes, <laughs> people in the audience lap versus the CPAs are sitting there with their arms crossed going, mm. we're not that boring. Our well, some of the, the ones I spoke at, I, I beg to differ. Some of the people at some of those original conferences, there were a lot of people just there to meet their requirements. Oh, I'm sure that's true. And I mean, and I, told you I came out of my cave in 15 well, yeah, I know, and opinion. we were there too. Anything. We, and we went, how many boring speakers have you gone to to get your CPE over the years? I mean, a million. So the bar was really low on both the speaker caliber and also the engagement you were supposed to have when you went to those events. It has dramatically changed since those days, thankfully. It, I think a couple of things came together. I think we all realized that if we were to sell our skill set better and talk to businesses about the fact that we, as advisors, we are out here. We can help you with these yeah. things. We want to make them aware of that. Um, yeah. But then, two some other things. Technology came in to the Technology thing. made a so big difference. being able to do it remotely. Yeah. Having tech stacks, having all of these great apps yeah. that you can use to allow us, you know, before you'd have to go to your client's place of business or they'd have to come to you. That was yeah. a lot of wasted time. Now everything's in the cloud. You've got great apps that solve every problem. The, the CPA industry now, we're coming to the vendors and saying, I need an app that does this for this client. 
and and people are are listening to us and they're changing wow. their apps and they're developing. I, new I think apps. the pro advisor community's done a lot more around that. It's still yeah. much more proactive and much more demanding about what's possible and and adopting these apps and really spending time to learn about them. And they're driving <laughs> the CPA profession forward. I think they are because it's like, yeah, it's like our clients this, are moving us forward as well into the cloud adoption and all that stuff that we were hesitant to do. Well, with this conversation about pricing, you know, first it was. First, it was get away from hourly, be fixed and flat, and then it was be value, and then it was be premium pricing. And, you know, we had all these pricing conversations as well. Oh, yeah. Um, but in an effort to be able to generate the profit margins that we wanted, we had to be able to get the accounting piece done better and faster that's to right. leave more time for the advisory for other thing. Stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's so one of our... driving the fix all these little pains in my butt as to how, why I can't print a check <laughs> remotely. Yeah. Um, all those problems so we can concentrate on the things that are going to drive the business and so i think we did drive the industry and and so many crazy great apps have come out that it's both are for our clients and that are both for accountants to, to yeah. use as well so yeah. much technology came out and then COVID hit and everybody got used to working remotely well, then your clients didn't ask you to make the trip to their office and they weren't and, making the trip to your office everybody got comfortable with remote and that just frees up so much time to work on the important stuff than traveling back and forth to somebody's office. I think that was one of the biggest benefits of COVID. I mean, we were all, our firm was all remote. I had a remote bookkeeping business that I started in 2014. I mean, I had teams of people. We were all set up to do that, but our clients wanted FaceTime. They did. And the biggest benefit for us of COVID was that they got over that. Everybody's grandma yep. learned how to use Zoom. Yep. So it did. It made a big shift for us in a positive way and really freed us to way. not have to go. And now we can also, if you have a specialty like my firm has, and mine is very unique because we're all the wineries are in Napa Valley and we're in a unique geography, but it also allowed you to take that expertise and expand into other geographies and really focus on a niche or niche as y'all fancy pants people in, <laughs> in Canada call us it. Southerners, we say niche. Trisha and I say niche, like niche, niche but, um, the remote ability to do that now is so much easier. If you pick a thing you like, now you can go global with that and serve those clients without having to show up on site. Right. Um, so it, it is a huge gift. And yeah, the, the technology, but that's another thing, Tricia. There's this small number of people going to these conferences and there are many firms that are clueless about any of this automation, particularly on the CPA side. The bookkeeping community is in there, I hope, and on I top know. of these things. They are so the, far ahead of the game. But the CPAs, the I know. I know. And, and it, what's also funny is I've been to some of these bigger products, like, like some of these higher end company uh, software events. And the bigger products are just getting to the place where they're doing automated bank wrecks and things like that. And the small business apps are ahead of what these larger company solutions are doing. So we're pushing innovation in many ways from what we're doing in the small business space and what bookkeepers and, and client accounting solution folks and, and all of us together in the number space are trying to do for our clients. So it's really, I think it's a fun time to be doing this stuff. I think it's a really fun time. What I can tell you is the difference between the joy I have every day and how much I, I like what I'm doing and how many hours I work and the impact I think I'm having both with my clients and with my staff, mm -hmm. it is 180 degrees different than that summer that I said, I hate what I do for a living. What am I going to do? How am I going to get out of tax? And fortunately enough, I got led down the road. I did feel like it was slow because I did notice the bookkeepers were making a lot of inroads and I couldn't, there were things I couldn't do with CPA behind my name because generating financial statements with us is a thing. Yeah. Um, I yeah. did feel like it was slow. I did tend, attend a lot of conferences constantly talking to me about value pricing and moving to advisory and not this. telling me how um, that it did take the, when you came up and said, we have, we're going to do this DIY program and you can take it over a year. Um, I said, okay, you know, by, by then I knew you, I'd, I'd heard you speak. I knew you and I were similar enough in our approaches and our personalities and what we wanted to bring that I thought it would be good. Um, but it, it was, it was just really life changing to one, give me 
give me the realization and the permission to just start talking to my clients and asking the questions. I mean, there are so many questions that you can ask to get your clients talking about their business. And then then it doesn't stop it. Okay, now I've asked you the question and cash flow is the problem. And, and so, you know, now what do we do? Um, yeah. just, just to give me all of the tools that I could work with my client where I didn't have to come up with a solution all by myself. It's work with my client and tear the thing down until you can find the pieces and, and you just build it back up until it's this great working thing and then move on to the next thing. It was the first, the level five was the first thing that didn't talk to me about the fact that I should be doing advisory. It talked to me about the fact, here's how you go about doing advisory. Um, and it was, mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I've told you this many, many times. It, it was the thing that changed for me. The, the other class that I took, I got the pricing model down and I, I sell what I do really well. I mean, people like me because I'm genuine. I really do care. I do want to go, do a good, a job, do a good job. I am a CPA with a personality and I am creative. I could sell it. And the first thing gave me the confidence to, to price things higher. Yeah. Uh, but I still, part of me felt bad and I'm like, my God, they just hired me to do this for 3000 a month. What the heck am I going to do to be more of that? <laughs> That's um, the challenge, right? And so what we do is yes. give you the tools and then you have the exactly. confidence to do the pricing. Yes. And that's now the thing. I yeah, I want to no price it. I have no problem with what I charge. I have no yeah, problem and what with what I, I used charge to do because I've got tools. What I used to do was set the price and then I would always look at what I was delivering and think it wasn't enough. And I would try to add more and more stuff in. So what yep. I'd end up doing is commit a ton of stuff, way yeah. more value than what I was pricing because I didn't have confidence that those things I was going to do were Way too valued. much scope for what yeah, you were the, so I would the keep growing yeah. the scope because I felt yep. guilty about the price. This way, I know that what I do matters. That's why I named the, my brand the Impactful Advisor. I want you to be able to make an impact with those clients that you're reaching. And I know that if you take these tools out and do them, you will. Yeah. And that's it's, how we, that's amazing. how we change the world. The accountants are going to change the world. So what is this advisory that. thing? I think I know about it. We're keeping the, the engine moving forward, the economic engine that feeds families and all that stuff. So what is this advisory thing? What does advisory mean to you anyway, Tricia? What is it? And what's this level five thing? And you notice I have my five Basset hounds there. Yes. So uh, the advisory <laughs> thing is talking to a client about their business and getting away from my bookkeeper has a hard time reconciling my bank account. Uh, <laughs> we have a lot of duplicate transactions coming in on the feed. Um, they talk about their day to day uh these things are a hassle. These processes don't work really well. We're not very consistent. It's getting them out of sort of the minutia of what's not going well. And it's let's, let's, let's get up here at the 10,000 foot level and let's talk about this business and how it's supposed to run and what was it supposed to do. And so talk to me about, you know, what services do you provide and how do we provide them? And we start up here and we figure out what is it you do and how should we do it and what's the best practice for doing that and you keep drilling down until you can determine that we do not have a great process for this thing um whether it's how you bring a new client in the door you know like and we don't we don't have a niche I, i'm all about niches but we we don't really have one other than we work with a lot of attorneys but we have trucking companies and we have bakeries and we have all kinds of things and 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 it's it's getting down to what what makes the business successful what would make this business successful and you take each one of those things and you drill it down into okay well how do we get that to work better and so the the scope analysis that we talk so much about, you know, it talks about what's financially going on with the company, what, what's going on with the customers, what's going on with operations, what's going on with your people and what's the end in mind. It takes a person's story, a pe person who owns a business, it takes their story and it puts it into context in a way that we can then attack the core issues and not have them come to us because their QuickBooks is a mess. Exactly. It's like, okay, we got, we got to fix that. We absolutely have to fix that. Because that mess. underlies and That's what we call yeah, level we need one financial service. information. The numbers yes. have to be right, but they also have to be understandable yes. to whoever's right. looking at them. Because otherwise, who cares that's, if they're right? That's the other thing that I love about level five that it brought out is 
uh, you know, as accountants, we're all about the tax return and that balance sheet and that income statement. And are they right? You know, do they mm-hmm. tie? Is everything working? We never got to, is this information relevant to our client? Exactly. And if you were to ask your client, and it's in, it's in some of Edie's work, if you were to ask your client, are you looking at your balance sheet or income statement? No, they're not. We deliver balance sheets and income statements every single month without fail, every single month to our clients. Do we ever see them download them? No, we don't. We have a meeting with them every month that we talk to them about them, but we yeah. only spend a little bit of time on the balance sheet and the income statement. And I only spend time there to point out things that, hey, did you realize that your receivables are getting a little old? Or, hey, what, what's in the CPA suspense that we haven't cleaned up? Or I point yeah. out some things that I find interesting. The next thing is, is what data do you need from us that's relevant into how you would go into work every single day to make this business more successful? What's a relevant report? Yeah, What's relevant and, and it needs to be timely also, Trisha. They yes. can't wait till three no. months after the, the no. year is closed to find out how they did. They can't make no. proactive changes like that. The financial statements that we give out by the third week of every single month without fail, you know what? That month's over. <laughs> that month's three months. That month is three weeks ago. That yeah. data is good. It gives us things that we can work on, but it's old. It's historical data. We have to start leading. We have to start looking towards the future. So you have to have clean financials so that we can start to figure out that receivables need to get better. That's right. Or that so that's a scorecard. It's a place yes. to start, but it's yes. not a proactive, actionable item no. that I can do something about until next no. month. It's too so late. So we talk to our clients okay. about What's important data? How many clients are coming in the door? How many clients that come into the door turn into, you know, a client? How many, how many people that come in the door turn into a client? We find out for your business, talking to our, you know, the, the client themselves and asking them what's a leading indicator of, of how we'll get a new client, how we'll keep a client, how we provide great customer service, how we can provide, exactly. uh, you know, to upsell. We talk to our client about what, what is better. the best possible way to get and keep a client, what, what's important to them. That's not the balance sheet and the income statement. It, it's a bunch of other kinds of reports, which is why we both love Fathom so much. It starts with financial data, yeah. but we can start with those key performance indicators. We, you can add report, you can add non-financial data to that, and you, you can, can actually really talk to your insights. people about what's driving the success. And for most of your clients, it is not looking at their balance sheet for sure. Nobody looks at their balance sheet and their income statement is old. That's right. So it has to be a way of we have to start talking about why do receivables lag? Is it a is it a problem with how long it takes us to bill the client? Is it a problem with our credit policies are too uh, lax? lax? Is it a problem with we never follow up? There are all kinds of things. We all know that you let a receivable get to 90 days. That client kind of doesn't feel like they have to pay you because you weren't that interested in getting paid because you let me go 90 days. You know, so it's it's fixing all of the little problems that, you know, is it your billing process that is why our receivables lag? Do we not bill accurately? Um, there are so many things that you have to drill down and find out why our receivables are getting old. And, and it's not just that the client's not paying or the customer's not paying. And it's such a shift, Trisha, from us just tying it out to the supporting detail, which is what we were trained to do. Yep. I have a list right. of who owes me what. Yep. I make sure that number in total matches what's on the balance sheet and I'm done. I don't ask, why do you have all these people that are 90 days past due? Why or, are 50% of your receivables past 90 days? Yeah. And what's the that, process that's behind this? We that's don't ask question. that. We weren't well, trained. Here's the thing. People also assume, well, it's just because you're not collecting. And right. then when you start to use this stuff and talk to your you clients, you start looking it, at the process. You start to oh find gosh. out that it's not. So we have a we have a big trucking company that he, he bought this trucking company from somebody else. And we looked at his receivables. Well, they let their trucks out the door without the people paying for the invoice. Who the heck lets your car out of a maintenance garage without you paying for the maintenance? Yeah. So we're letting these 18 wheelers out the door and they haven't paid this. I'm like. Okay, well, we got to stop that. And then it's, okay, well, how can we stop that? Well, we need a better contract that communicates to them how we do this. But but here's the difference, Trisha. You don't come in there and tell them how to fix it, I hope. What we do is bring the experts inside that company in a room and say, what are, this is the problem we're seeing, or this is the process step we've just documented as a group. Is there a roadblock here that we might address? And then they can say, yeah, this is a thing because so-and-so never gets us whatever we need to do this. Okay, what can we do about it? And now you guys, the frontline workers and gals, tell us what we're going to count to see that we fix this problem. Right. And that's the big shift for me. This fact well, that we get them to measure, not we tell them what to count. That's a really good point about the level five advisory as well is 
First of all, we bring our client and we let them do a lot of talking. We ask them a lot of questions. We get a lot of information. We let them bring to us the expertise that they have. But what we also talk to them about and advise them on is if you're having a problem on the manufacturing floor, the person sitting up in the office in the building next door, he doesn't know what that problem is. The person on the manufacturing floor is going to be the best person who can tell you why our defect rate is so high. Exactly. Let your people tell you what about their process does not allow them to be as successful as you need them to be. Because those frontline workers will tell you they what know. it is that we yeah. do that for that makes their job harder. And not only can we get great answers from them, but then those people are happier in their job because they had a say. They were empowered to speak up and say, well, this room is designed poorly. We're walking from over here to over there, that whole What's the toast thing, guys? Toast video. Kaizen, yes. toast video. Yeah. One of our tools. We're walking from toolkit. over here to yeah. over there to over here. Get your frontline people to talk to you about what makes their job difficult and how they could have, you know, we, we could have less warranty work and we could have less rejects and we could have less waste. They'll tell you. We can't have the people at the high end talk about what it's like to to build a you know rocket ship if they're not building a rocket ship they they know how to manage people they don't they're not building the rocket ship so yeah. that was another great thing about this is you start off with your business owners you know the the c suite people but then you talk to them about let's let's get down below and let's talk to our people about how we make their lives difficult and how they could do a better job if we gave them tools and and again it's either process or it's people or it's training or it's yeah you know, but right. it really it? it really approaches a business it teaches you to go into a business about all of the working pieces, all of the cogs that are all, you know, connecting with each other. And there's so much more there than looking at a balance sheet and an income statement. Yeah, it, it's all of the mystery, all of the magic happens outside of the financials. It really life. does. It's yeah, in the it customer's does. operations people in that end in mind, the execution of the strategy, definition yes. of what it is we're trying to do, which oftentimes list is only in the heads of the owner and none of the team knows exactly what it is we're trying to aim for. So all that stuff comes together. And if you want to do advisory, and my definition of advisory is helping a client move the needle forward in the direction of their dreams. And if you're not doing that, to me, that is an advisory. First, no. I got to know what the dream is. Exactly. And That's then I got to know start. what are the things we got to do to, to move right. forward in the direction of whatever that dream is. And we, we start that with step. the dream. We start yeah. with the dream first. Tell me how this was supposed to fit into your yeah. life. What is Were it you're you trying to sell do it? Here? When you were yeah. better, better, ready to retire, was it supposed to bring you more income? Was it supposed to bring you freedom? What was it you yeah. wanted to do? Let's start there. And then you start there and you get all the way down to the people on the front line. And that's why I say we love bringing people to their joy. Because when, when we see our clients, and this happens all the time, when they're like, oh my God, you guys are the greatest. We love you. Because all we have done is help them find the information that they knew and give them a way to put it into practice and they get happier and the frontline workers get happier and they love the heck out of us. And I, it's, it's joy every day. And, and it's a complete switch from before. It's that impact. It's making a difference in the lives of those clients that I believe we're in accounting and everybody that I've ever talked to over the years always says, I love it when I can do something that helps my client do something, either save taxes, which counts, right? I mean, that's advisory. If you can do tax planning stuff, um, as long as that is in alignment with whatever the dream is, but it's deeper than that. It's what can I do that really helps you in some way with that forward motion in a big way. And also the alignment of the teams is a big part of that. If I, if I just meet with the owner and come up with a bunch of metrics and ratios, yep. those things aren't going to happen or improve without buy-in and engagement no. from the team. And I've got to work it all the way through the organization, starting with, the core underlying financials have to be done, but then I've got to educate people about what all these things mean. And then we could start looking for things to count and move and how to make life better. So this is just a screenshot while we're talking about advisory of what the training looks like when you go inside the online training site. And this is the level five model, which starts with technical training and works all the way through to continuous improvement. And in each element, you get theoretical conceptual training, and then you get hands-on tools you can download, including slide decks, how to sell, how to talk about it, how to educate people, um, meeting agenda formats, checklists, engagement, billing examples, everything you need yep. to do this work with clients. And it comes from 20 years of live training with accountants all over the world. 
And so as she developed training, she would get questions and requests for stuff. And then she would create a tool that would address that particular issue. So for this material, we have the benefit of 20 years of testing and vetting by accountants all over the place. And I think that's one of the big differentiators as well. I think the tool set, the, the, the biggest thing is one that it just opens up your mind to, to realize that this is possible. Uh -huh. And then the questions are huge. But then it gets you when you start getting into the tool sets. Um, and you don't have to use all of the tools. You, you might, there might be pick some tools you'll never and use, use for a client. Yeah, yeah. pick a some couple. Some you'll never use for anybody. But the other yeah. beautiful thing about this is, so I'm a tiny little firm and our companies are not huge. But this level advisory, I'm using it, my tiny little firm, we're using it. This level five advisory, it, it you could go from a company that makes $500,000 a year, you could go to a company that makes $150 million a year. It would work. It works at all levels. It's so, it is so advanced and so, deep and and well thought out and inspiring it's it's very inspiring work you could do it from a huge client you can do it for a tiny client now you might not use all of the tools that are out there yeah. but mostly it's the when you expand your mind to see that these tools are out here it just keeps you open to you know you're working with a client and you're doing scope and you're doing critical success factors and then you think oh you know what we might want to do a high arc a hierarchical. I hate that word. I can't say the hierarchical. Hierarchy of measures. There Thank you, you. That thing. Yeah. You just know that they're out there, so you can your your tools can grow with your client. That's exactly um, right. My thing is, I. Well, I like people to know that creative visualization, to have the dream and to focus on the dream, I want everybody to know a big, fantastic life is possible. And That's I can right. help you get there because I've got these tools that show you what's important and how to break something down so it's not quite so overwhelming. You get a lot of clients who are just overwhelmed with what they think is going wrong with their exactly. business. And they shame. just need somebody and to shame. And shame. Yeah. You yeah. just need somebody to break it down into these pieces that we can fix. And then they start to see their joy. I love letting people realize that we we can take this dream of you want to work three days a week and have a villa in Italy. I, I We can get there. We can talk to you about ways of getting there. You can have a big dream. That's where I get my joy in helping people. And, and you, this and hold on, and you argued with me when I said accountants can change the world. And that's what you're doing every I'm single not, day. Uh, I, you are. People, you're maybe. changing the world. You're making <laughs> dreams happen for people. That's how I you like change the world. I like to let people know that dreams can happen because you and I have talked about this. I use creative visualization for a, lot, a few different things in my life. There wasn't a time that it failed me. Yeah. I'm just pissed that I got so unhappy in my practice and didn't put the tool into play for myself. Yeah, I had to get really unhappy for me to realize that I had okay. used this visualization before and it had worked wonders. And I just needed to remind myself. And now I'm here. I mean, it's yeah. tax season. I'm still not working 40 hours a week. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> it can be done. Yes. And the tools are not rocket science. No. But there are things if you had time to really sit down and think about a question to ask, or if you were just enlightened to the fact that you need to shift the way you think about client interactions, you could come up with it. But they're all there. So you could just take something and go, oh, my God, here's five questions I'm going to ask today of every client that I talk to. And the work that comes out of that and the insights and the help that you can provide it happens almost automatically. It's just because we haven't had time to think about what to ask and to really put ourselves in the shoes of those clients, especially right now. And there's always a right now. There's been chaos in our marketplace forever. And now we've got this whole banking thing going on. We've got all these other issues. It's time for us to be partners in our client's success. Yeah. And it's just very, very possible. And it's so fun. It's so much more fun. It's so much more satisfying. Um, and you can sense the relief in your clients and your customers when they realize, oh, my God, I really do have a partner in what I'm trying to do here. I mean, if you were to read the messages that are happening on our Slack and count, you know, where our clients are communicating this, if you could just yeah. read the tone of of them communicating with us and how happy they are with how it's going and how they know they can just come to us with anything and we're going to be there to try and help Fantastic. them find a solution. I mean, it, my staff is happy. I'm happy. I am making more money than I ever made doing a bunch of tax returns and being miserable and working until 2 AM. And I feel like I'm, I'm letting people build the businesses that they originally wanted before they got drugged down into the, day-to-day -day mm -hmm. hassles and, and hurdles and challenges of running a business. And we just help people, you know, focus a little bit on, you can't, you can't make the business grow, grow if you're working in the business 
more than you're working on it. We let people know you have to work on the business too, not just in it. And it, it, the conversations are interesting. There's so much value in it. Our clients are really, really happy. We're making a difference with them. And I mean, I, I just, I, I'm only ticked it took me this long to get here. I know, me too. I, that's what I said. When I left the firm as partner and then I went on the road and then I discovered these tools. I went, if I had known about this when I was I in know. public accounting, I could have been happy um, doing different kinds of work. But I don't think I would have had the space to do it because I was seen as a tax person. And right. I don't think I could have escaped that, which is one of the reasons that I left. I went, I'm going to be doing taxes for the rest of my life, even though I was really enjoying the computer consulting side of what I was doing. So, Tricia, we're almost we are at time. Wow, that went fast. Where can people find you? Give us your website. Uh, well, the website is O'ConnorCPAFirm.com, O-C-O-N-N-O-R, CPAFirm.com. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me on LinkedIn. I think I have a O'Connor CPA firm page. I've got a Trisha O'Connor on LinkedIn. Yeah. Cause you just have Trisha. Yeah. We've yeah. got a Facebook page. You, if yeah. you Google me, if you Google Trisha O'Connor CPA, I'm going to come up. I come all up right. really well. All I right, come up so good. well that we're turning clients down all over the place. Yeah, um, Which is so. a great problem to have. You take the ones you want and you do exactly. the work that you want to do. And that's the whole point of this training. Also, I also have a passion for accountants. I want them to build the life of their dreams as well. And I think we're getting there one advisor at a time. I got to so, tell you guys, if, if you're wanting to make the switch, if you want to get out of the drudgery of what you're doing and feel like you're really impacting your clients, this program is so worthwhile. It is so affordable. Given a year to do it is more than enough time to get through the materials. I, I can't wow. say enough. I've told this to Jeannie multiple times. She I can't say enough about how it helped me <laughs> You really, really move the needle. I don't think I don't think I could have done it without this program. I think I'd still be struggling and, and possibly dealing more with people's pain than people's joy. Um, I, I can't say enough about how it was. It, it changed the way we do things. Such an honor, Tricia. You make my heart sing. I know Edie Osborne, if she could listen to you right now, would be over the moon with excitement that these tools are reaching people like you. Yep. And that we are changing the world. I don't care what you say, but we are. <laughs> um, and I think we need to realize that as a profession of numbers people, that the stuff we do matters, that we keep people yeah. afloat. We feed families. We get children in school and education, give them a pathway to their own success. So um, with that, thank you so very much, Tricia, for being here. Great information. Um, I love your enthusiasm and your clients are so very fortunate to have you on their team. Oh, thank you. So stay with me for a second. We're going to end the broadcast. Bye, everybody.